Investor Roundtable panelists. Greg Shepard is the founder of Boss Capital Partners. He's an active investor. Sergey Young is the founder of the $100 million Longevity Vision Fund. Alex Fair, MS, is the founder and CEO of MedStart. Harpreet Singh Rai is the CEO of Aura and a member of its board. Dr. Jim Flatt, who just had the pleasure of listening to CEO Brightseed, who gave us uh, our keynote. Please help me welcome our panelists. We at Longevity Vision Fund have a mission of changing one billion lives by bringing affordable and accessible version of digital healthcare to the world. And we invest in, in broad range and, and spectrum of different technologies, which is you know, making breakthroughs in healthcare from uh, affordable, accessible version of diagnostic devices like ultrasound devices to use of artificial intelligence in diagnostic and drug development and some futuristic stuff like human avatars, organ regeneration technologies, etc. Hi all, I'll be uh, subbing in for Maximilian as he's stuck on an airplane right now. Uh, so uh, I'm Chris, uh, principal at Neue Fund. Uh, Neue Fund is a uh, science-driven uh, early stage venture fund uh, that invests primarily in seed and series A startups uh, across healthcare, life sciences, and deep technology verticals. Uh, we have particular keen interest on finding companies that have real world solutions to real world problems um, and uh, focus on primarily the intersection of uh, computational approaches approaches and uh, biotech and life science companies. Uh, we have approximately 35 portfolio companies right now, uh, spanning everything uh, from uh, health technology and inform information technology to uh, deep tech, uh, agricultural biotechnology. Um, and yeah, uh, we strive to really use a, an evidence-based approach um, and scientific method in uh, evaluating all of our startup companies and uh, look forward to contributing in the next wave of uh, future tech and changing the world. Boss Capital uh, focuses on series seed uh, businesses. We uh, check sizes range from half a million to 10 million. I know that's the large range, but that's really what it is. We do SaaS and tech-enabled services businesses. Um, our investments are literally all over the world. Been investing for three years from our mid venture funds. Um, obviously, started as a scientist, and um, we use uh, our crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and crowd validation website, MidStarter.com, as our as one of our methods for. Uh, figuring out which healthcare startups are the best ones to invest. Um, so we have an algorithmic approach that's a little bit different. Uh, we've got nine portfolio companies ranging from CGMs that uh, use radio frequency and um, don't have any needles and, and work better than uh, Dexcoms, for example. To everyone on the panel, I think one of the things that we want to explore is this notion that specifically within biotech and life sciences, uh, we've seen uh, how deep tech has really allowed for um, let's call it dematerialization and the de-economics of the traditional, you know, FDA-driven types of companies. Now, the FDA process hasn't gone away, but certainly uh, I think some of the cost structure that used to be more traditional uh, has started to dissipate. And then the other thing is this notion of convergence of technologies and how that is enabling capabilities and enablement that wasn't maybe even possible, let's say, five, ten years ago. Maybe if I could uh, start, uh, Scott, one of, the, one of the things we have not yet seen but I think we we do expect to see some improvement. Our success rates uh, ultimately in in phase three uh, trials, and you know one of the biggest uh, impediments and biggest issues has been the occurrence of uh, you know sort of off target or, or side effects that uh, you know depending on the nature of the drug, if it's more uh, to be used for a chronic you know for chronic treatment, uh, for example, a diabetes drug the safety profile has to be pretty good because in that case you're really le much less willing to tolerate side effects than if you are, are treating cancer. And so I think the, the, the big data um, AI coupled with much more extensive knowledge of, of omics data that we can collect from patients is going to give us the ability to start to understand in earlier trials where uh, there may where potential risk may exist and and perhaps even inform strategies to attenuate it. So I certainly see that is one area where we see improvement. Um, there's an, another area, and, and you see it with companies like Recursion uh, Pharmaceuticals that are actually 
using AI to data mine and under, look at, at compounds that were fundamentally safe, but didn't meet their primary endpoints and therefore were abandoned for a particular indication. They are gaining some traction in mining all that data and discovering or identifying uh, latent benefits for those uh, for those targets to in, uh, for those uh, uh, therapeutics in order to repurpose them. So again, starting with something, and so I, I think you're certainly seeing more of that, which again is data driven. That we are uh, enjoying at the moment is actually invention and and bigger use of biological clocks, which is basically a set of biomarkers which can help you to conduct trials in much faster data-driven way because your longevity experiment 20, 40 years ago was actually taking, you know, big group of very old people and just, you know, sitting in a lab <laughs> waiting until all of them will die the next 10, 20 years while these days a combination of different biomarkers can actually point out to you in a pretty fast way in you know, 6, 12, 18 months whether you know this substance is working or not or are you on the right track or not so that i think is a huge yeah. compression specifically of the first stage of drug development we're seeing more interest than ever you know from our side even in the drug development stage of um you know researchers and frankly these farm you know pharmacologic companies looking at other sources of data so even, you know, I would say, you know, before making it into the end state of healthcare per se, at least in the development side, can can definitely speak to that, that we've seen a lot more interest from many different data sources um, that frankly help, I think, you know, accelerate and, and might be easier actually in the drug development phase than necessary in the end user phase. Um, just as just as a aside, but we're, we're seeing that a lot from our perspective. Absolutely, and I mean, I, I'd like to chime in as well, and I, I totally agree with all your guys' points that also, if we look at the functional tenants of the data being used, right, with heterogeneic patient data, we're able to go into the FDA without more powerful, you know, uh, portfolio of assets that have more critique validation towards the actual individual patient populace that the drug would be developed for. And I think extrapolating from that, that, you know, either RWE real world evidence data and heterogeneic data right off the bat um, can really reduce and mitigate clinical failures um, in the FDA pipeline so that we're not in this functional paradigm of taking 10 years and spilling, spending a billion dollars on asset development, but rather we have the emergence of these computational bioplatform companies mm -hmm. that have multiple shots on goal with great data um, and to really you know, bridge that gap from the in vivo translational efficacy into the clinic and then ultimately getting that therapeutic to market to impact that patient populace. I think from my perspective, predictability is key, especially when it comes to these things that have a long tail. So you're, you know, the amount of time it takes before you know whether you have a winner or a loser, these things are going to reduce the amount of time it takes for that to happen, making it more predictable, meaning that Personally, I know we would be willing to uh, pay higher multiples for those sort of transactions. So I think that that for us leads to more transactions in a space that is traditionally exclusive to those that are willing to take high risks on long tail investments. The other interesting point is that, you know, think about Longevity Vision Fund, right? We are hundred million dollars fund. And right now we have an opportunity to play in a field where 10, 20 years ago, I mean, you would need billions of dollars. You need mm -hmm. to have a big pharma, you know, firepower uh, in terms of the capital to play. Because out of 5,000, you know, candidates for drug, 12 years later and $2.6 billion later, you'll have one in CVS or in Walgreens in pharmacy, right? So right now, because of democratization of this space, you know, we have an opportunity with pretty small tickets, like one, two, three million dollars, to participate in this race. And I think it's applicable to, you know, pretty much a lot of players in this field. What we're seeing is more convergence of data. Um, I think, frankly, the more and more we see that uh, alongside, frankly, you know, more clinical research, um, the, the more all of this is going to get sped up, um, whether it's a consumer angle or a medical angle. Um, and, and I think that benefits people and lives. So I, I think um, really it's still very fragmented. Um, I think a lot of data sources, there's questions about accuracy and validation, mm -hmm. which I think we need to continue to invest and improve. And you know, we have, I think that's that's actually something we found this year in particular really successful um, and, and seen other wearables, you know, follow suit. So 
I think um, I think that yeah, you know, both convergence of data, both sort of validation of these data, new streams of data, is, is really what's going to continue to push this whole space forward. I'll just build on uh, you know our our theme when we're talking about uh, uh, digital health wearables. Um, there, you know, we're still at a point uh, where we're only able to. Uh, measure, you know, a, a small number of, um, of aspects uh, related to health in a way that's been truly validated. And so we're, we're, we are in this sort of um, uh, gray area where we can provide uh, information that's probably generally uh, correct, but not always um, valid. And, and there was, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a healthy critique of uh, Apple's uh, most recent, you know, launch with the um, uh, the blood ox uh, oximeter um, and and some of the variable data uh, that were obtained, which could either give comfort to someone that I have no issues, or you know, shock you into thinking I, I need to run down to the emergency room right now. So we are um, we do have to be very careful, and I think the industry has a uh, has to be very careful around how it actually markets these uh, devices because I I do see they're they're going to have an important uh, role in in our future, but we have to be very clear about what they mean and what they don't mean. Otherwise, there's yeah potential for a, a lot of problems, and so that's just one thing. I don't know if others see that or or see other issues, but well, related point. Uh if you, can, if you think about healthcare companies of the future, like 10 years from now, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much sure it's going to be Apple, Amazon, <laughs> Google. And, you know, I, if Apple would like to add another trillion dollar of market cap, they would need to go to transportation, healthcare and education. Well, this is like, you know, three things that they can disrupt massively. So my question is, uh, whether it's going to be positive for the competition in the space, whether it's actually will help us to sustain this democratization of mm -hmm. entry of different players and sense of competition in this in this field. You know, I do hope it's going to be positive, but I'm also afraid it might actually be very difficult for startups to fight with this huge conglomerates. So, so uh, Sergey, if I may, I, I love your question about the competition and, and, mm -hmm. and decentralization and democracy. But I, I want to also go back to Jim's point and give Harpreet an opportunity to yeah. help distinguish the difference between consumer wearable versus medical grade wearables and where things are going from a medical grade. Yeah, I think Jim, thanks, Scott, thanks for the question. Jim, you, you really, I think, made a salient point. Um, I think often with new technology, right, um, and when you have newer audiences using them, mm -hmm. the, and, and that's misinformation. That's, yeah. You know, um, you know, so we now, and they're early data out, um, and, and at least one in a preprint that's available publicly, you know, showing we can detect the onset of illness of some infection, you know, up to three days in advance. And that doesn't mean that's always the case, to your yep. point. And it doesn't mean it's always COVID either. Mm -hmm. right? um, I, I like to sort of tell people if our positive test rates in this country are one to two percent, that means 99 other people got tested that thought they had COVID. They, don't. <laughs> they still have symptoms. Um, yeah. So I think you know the benefit we're we're seeing is you know one we have to validate that with research. I think two you have to educate the consumers. That's where mm -hmm. it's down. You know some of the press headlines that got out there. You know, when you know, the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, you know, on their own website, mm -hmm. the dean of the institute, uh, Ali Ruzai, actually published some early, you know, just yeah. early takeaways. Hey, we're seeing changes up to three days in advance. Um, all of a sudden, we had press headlines saying this, <laughs> this is, or us saying this. I was like, I didn't even know it went out. Um, yeah. So I think, I think there's a lot of miseducation or mis misunderstanding. And, yeah. and that yeah. onus, I think, comes back, frankly, to us as a company. Um, it's our job to educate people how to use this, you know, and, and the way we've done that more with our B2B and enterprise customers is mm -hmm. it, this is just one step in this, in a, in a potential solution. Um, you know, this, you have to get tested. This is not a medical device. Sure, we can provide maybe, you know, early indication, um, you know, but then prioritize testing for that group of people because it looks like there's a higher probability that they're getting sick. You know, this isn't a replacement. This is in conjunction to. Um, and, and I think that's the way we've described it. And a lot of it, I really think, comes down to education and more and more validation. The more and more validation we can do, I think the more, you know, 
the, the wearable industry didn't start out that way. I think you know a lot of these people actually hide, to your point, a lot of the data, um, you know, because they don't want researchers to actually understand all the noise in this data. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think the more we can allow it to be more open and, and more trust yeah. and more transparent and more education, frankly, that that's how we'll overcome some of these barriers. I want to go back to uh, what Sergey was talking about. This is uh, also a very important topic around competition. And I want to bring in Greg as well from your perspective. You know, believe it or not, this panel is a really good kind of a, a symbolism of, you know, what we're trying to do to infuse competition by providing the capital, providing the innovation from the entrepreneurs. Greg, can you talk about how innovation actually allows for decentralization, higher degree of competition? Yeah, I mean, I have, you know, I got to a point in my life where I was, you know, kind of done, I guess, uh, with regards to making money and i went into politics a little bit and i couldn't seem to make anything happen there so i decided what i would do is spend the rest of my life helping entrepreneurs succeed and by helping entrepreneurs succeed it helps with wealth distribution because the entrepreneurs that i kept running into were entrepreneurs that didn't have very much that's why they were trying to become an entrepreneur in fact four percent of people that aren't wealthy have a chance of even becoming wealthy and 40% of those people are entrepreneurs. So for me, I try to find entrepreneurs and then I try to help them and bring up income equality, um, specifically for dreamers, first time Americans, uh, first generation Americans and things like that. And I think that any, any business startup that comes from the mind of an entrepreneur and the majority of them are, you know, what I call altruistic capitalism, meaning a lot of the things you guys are talking about is capitalism with the outcome being altruistic and that those things will help with that income equality and also bring new things to light. I mean, the United States, as an example, had 113 uh, unicorns last year and China had 93. And we are supposed to be the country that visualizes things and doesn't manufacture anything. We manufacture things out of China and other countries. So I think that the, uh, the the future of the of the country and the world has to do with entrepreneurs, and that's the core of my focus. And a lot of the stuff, you know, I'm sitting here watching you guys, listening to these things, and you know, candidly, some of this stuff is just over my head. But I understand just enough to say, okay, that's a business I'd invest in. And I'm interested in the entrepreneur because I see it as the horse and the jockey, right? You have the the horse being the business and the jockey being the entrepreneur. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people bet on the jockey, but unfortunately, the jockey's never ridden a horse before, uh, so they fall <laughs> off. Um, and it's up to us to, to help them stay on the horse and ride it all the way to the finish line. I, I hope that was a good contribution. Yeah, thank no, you. Th thank well you, Greg. said. <laughs> thank you. So, so Sergey, I want to again come back to you um, yeah. because I think it's a bit of a rhetorical question, right, in terms of uh, the competition. Yes, could a large big tech become the fintech as well as the health tech? The answer is yes, but they also are going to be the potential acquirers from a, from an M&A mm -hmm. perspective. So talk to us about your perspective on this topic. And then, Krish, uh, if you come in uh, after that and talk a little bit about how your portfolio is actually allowing for fostering competition. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so my point was actually more like a balancing act. So I do believe that um, there's, there's so many benefits that we can draw from you know, big tech you know, coming into healthcare. And I, I do believe that the change in healthcare will come not from the current players doing new things, it's going to be from new players doing new things, right? Disruptors. And one field which I'm particularly excited about, it applies to Aura and all our variables. We have this kind of old paradigm when we think about variables. We think it's fitness tracker. Well, it's not anymore. In just in few years time, and it's going to be case for Aura, for Apple Watch, uh, uh, for new Amazon wearable, for, fit, uh, for Fitbit. Uh, this will become our personalized healthcare device, right? We just add, you know, a few features there. And we're going to track like 95% of the information that we would need to for the medicine and healthcare uh, to be predictive, you know, personalized and proactive. This, this will be just amazing disruption and, and decrease of the healthcare costs, right? Because if you, if you put someone in emergency, it's just 10 to 20, and these are the real numbers, mm -hmm. 10 to 20 times more expensive than to approach 
even like the most dangerous killer disease like heart disease or cancer in proactive and at early stage way. So I'm actually very excited about this. We just need to be mindful that we need to make sure we leave enough room for the young talents and small companies to continue consistently, you know, bring new ideas and help us to disrupt this place in a positive way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Sergey. Um, for the precedent I set for our portfolio companies is creating tangible customer value. Um, the m biggest concern going back to our previous question uh, that I have going forward is AI has become such a buzzword like innovation where it's been diluted and completely ambiguous. And for me, um, you know, uh, the double-edged sword of yes, computational approaches can accelerate life science R&D in new discoveries in a whole bunch of different domain markets, but unlocking functional data insights that can translate into customer value that can be perceived by the market seems to be something that a lot of AI companies are kind of messing up right now. And when I talk to all of our founders, I say, you know, when I'm breaking down a simple problem to solution to market paradigm, I want to make sure that the product that they're bringing ultimately is influencing the customer in a way that unlocks not only unrealized market potential, but actually enhances the quality of life for, for everybody in the ecosystem, whether it's from an innovation standpoint, a life sciences standpoint, or a deep tech standpoint. Um, I really want to make sure that each company, you know, I, whether it be like our company, like in Silico Medicine, or we have Aranza or Stratios or other companies like that, where they're all using these applied deep tech and NLP and AI interfaces. I, I always benchmark them and say, hey guys, you know, we talked to the Aranza team, they're doing, you know, small molecule discovery with computational approach. Well, they're leveraging this heterogeneic data set. And I think that this is informing a lot better execution play on, on their future set. And then I'll talk to the other company and be like, well, you know, I want to make sure that the, the AI that you're using, the data you're using is, is going to go to one that's extrapolated and has that endpoint value. The customer says, wow, I have this percentage reduction in R&D costs, or I, you're able to bring this product to market X percentage faster, have tangible results that I can say at the end of the day, wow, you know, this, the, the unit economics, the ability to bring this product to market faster is above all the other benchmark standards of previous mm -hmm. workflow. And that's a that's great point. And I'm, I'm going to just chime in here because I think we're out of time. But I want to thank everyone on the round table for just a, a incredible uh, conversation. Thank you for the fluidity and the versatility.